Hi, I'm Dr. Laura Weber. I'm Dr. Rachel Sobolev. I'm Dr. Charlotte Corteau. And today we're going to learn about fiber optic intubation in the emergency room. Okay, so now we're going to talk about when we do this procedure. So there are three main indications for doing a fiber optic intubation. One is for a rescue method for failed endotracheal intubation. Second is as your primary method in an anticipated difficult airway. This could be in cases such as a tumor, um, edema from anaphylaxis, or trauma. And third is for any situation where paralysis may be a risk factor, such as in a respiratory or metabolic acidosis. Let's talk about the setup for fiber optic intubation. First, we're gonna talk about all of the materials that you'll need to have ready before you start. For the purposes of this video, we're going to assume that you have some experience with intubating. Uh, so you wanna have suction ready, you wanna have pre-oxygenation ready as well. This mannequin has a nasal cannula and a non-rebreather. You also wanna have your airway adjuncts ready. Sometimes you can use an oral pharyngeal airway to aid you in the procedure and you want to have your actual fiber optic. For the purposes of this video, we're going to use this GlideScope B-Flex. And this fiber optic actually connects straight to suction, which can be helpful for suctioning during the procedure. And then you want to have your ET tube ready as well. And it's important to note that you need to have an ET tube that's at least 0.5 larger than the size of your fiber optic. So you want to have at least a 6O tube. And so you'll preload the ET tube onto the fiber optic before you get started. And for this device, you do not need to take off this plastic adapter beforehand. And you can go ahead and get that set up with your syringe. So let's talk about sedation and analgesia. So for analgesia, we like to have topical lidocaine if, the, if we're, we have enough time. And so you can use aerosolized lidocaine, 4% uh, is preferred, but you can use whatever you have. And um, you just basically wanna get the patient as comfortable as possible. You also wanna think about what types of medicines you're gonna use for sedation. And this will be patient dependent. Some things that you can consider using are ketamine, which can be useful to have the patient in a dissociated and comfortable state, but beware that it can cause laryngospasm, which can make this procedure a little bit more challenging. Uh, you can also consider having pushes of Versed to keep the patient more comfortable, but also consider that this may cause respiratory depression as well. Now let's talk about how to perform the procedure itself. To begin, let's familiarize ourselves with the scope. You will hold the scope in your non-dominant hand because you will use your dominant hand to thread the tube through the cords. This lever controls the tip of the scope. The tip of the scope can move in four directions. It can move up and down and left and right. The lever moves the tip of the scope up and down and the handle moves the scope left and right. I will demonstrate that here. I'm pushing the lever down and the tip of my scope is going up and now I'm pushing the lever up and the tip of my scope is going down. If I turn my hand to the right, the tip of my scope goes to the left and if I turn my hand to the left, the tip of the scope goes to the right. Just remember that the tip of the scope will go in the opposite direction of your hand movements. Now let's perform the procedure. To begin, we want to maximize our patient's position. The patient will either be in the sitting position if you're performing an awake intubation, or in the supine position as shown here, but in the sniffing position. You really wanna maximize your visibility with the patient as much as the scenario allows. As Dr. Sobolev demonstrated, I have my tube preloaded on the actual scope itself. I'm going to place the tip of the scope in the patient's mouth, and I want to keep the scope as taut as possible to maximize my control. So I'm going to just advance my scope until I see a landmark. Typically, you want to advance until you see the uvula, followed by the arytenoids, followed by the vocal cords. Here, I see the arytenoids as well as the vocal cords. I'm going to advance my scope until I am just above the vocal cords. Now you can see I'm just above the vocal cords. Before you pass the tip of the core, uh, the tip of the scope, 
You want to paralyze the patient if this is an awake intubation to facilitate passage of the scope. I'm going to continue to advance my scope until I am through the vocal cords and all I see are the tracheal rings. Now that my tube is in place, I'm going to inflate my balloon and attach my bag valve mask as I would with any endotracheal intubation, looking for both end tidal and bilateral breath sounds. That concludes our procedural video.